<laughs> so we are now recording and so um welcome everybody uh my name is zach nicklin i am a uh co-chair of the uas cti with diana and uh with the national center for autonomous technologies uh diana and alina you're you're both familiar with there and so I'll turn them over in just a second. I just wanted to remind folks that uh, that this is being recorded. Uh, I am putting the uh, the address to the repository, the FAA repositories, in the chat, so you can see the link there. That'll bring you to both CTI and Connected by Drones. Uh, this recording should be up on the Connected by Drones side, hopefully before the end of the week. Here, uh, our guy who usually does that is is out sick today, so we'll hope he's back before the end of the week. Um, so outside of that, welcome. It's great to see you all again. I love seeing you folks all get together and, and talk about all the great stuff happening uh, in, the, in the drone world. And uh, that being said, I'm going to turn things over to Alina and Diana uh, to go from there. Thank you. I, um, I unshared the screen just for a minute so that I can make sure I capture all my notes. Sorry about that. So welcome everybody to another Connected by Drones meeting. Um, I'm Diana Robinson, a project manager in the UAS uh, Integration Office. Alina George is gonna be co-hosting with me today. Uh, and is also gonna be giving you an update on a few of those FAA rules and regs. Um, so I'm really excited that she's jumped in and, and wanted to do this. Uh, you're welcome to post questions in the chat throughout the meeting, and we should have time for uh, questions at the end of each session, live questions, and then we'll also uh, save the chat to be sure we do address all those questions, which means, and I, I wanted to bring this up, be sure your name is correct. I know uh, a couple meetings ago was like we wanted people to volunteer to help with something, and because it had like a funny little nickname. I never could figure out who that person was by the chat. So um, just, you know, be sure that if you're asking for something that we, we know how to get in touch with you. Um, so we've really been fortunate this past year to meet a few a few of you in person, uh, whether at Exponential, we've had some regional events, there have been different conferences and STEM events. And I just want to take a minute to say thank you, uh, especially for those of you who have participated. I've already seen a few of you on today that actually presented at, any, at one of our events uh, and or was just there. And that really does mean a lot to us. And it makes us look really good, too. I just have to say that. <laughs> so I'm going to pass it over to Alina for a few words, and then I'll go through the agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Diana. And thank you, Zach, for always being such a, a rock for us and, and helping us with all of this. Um, and, and of course, the whole team at NCAT. So we've had a lot going on this year. We're excited to share all of this with you. Um, importantly, I will be sharing some updates on on the new rules and regulations, as Diana mentioned, I'm sure that there will be questions. Um, and we've actually got a couple of folks on here today who will be able to, if I don't have the answer, hope they will have the answer for you. Um, so really excited to get into that. Um, Diana? Uh, just first, make sure, are you seeing the main first slide? That's a good I am. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> that means we're well on our way. Perfect. All right. And here's the agenda again. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're gonna have Elena start us off. She's gonna be talking about CBOs, free as fixed sites. Uh, as you all may or may not know, we have a lot of acronyms at the FA, but she'll tell you what those are. And then we're really looking forward to having our guest speakers today. Um, you know, a lot of what Alina and I do in outreach and engagement, there's others here today as well from our group, um, is just, connecting everybody. And that's how we kind of came up with the name for Connected by Drones. We want to make sure that you have people and resources available to you to meet your needs. And um, these events that we've gone out and traveled to, it was just such a great, great way to connect to that drone pro with that local government or that school. And so today's presentation is actually showing how one of our CTI schools, which is Ames Community College, has been working with Weld County. And so with that, let me go to the next one. And Alina, 
She is I'm my up. partner. She's my partner in crime, to say the least. We, she's just great to travel with and to work with and bounce ideas off on. Um, Alina, uh, take it away. All right. So community-based organizations. Um, this is something that has been in the works for a while, and we actually recently published the AC for it. So this is AC 9157 Charlie, and that was published October 20th this year. What it does, it's, it provides guidance on the recognition of community-based organizations. I will just refer to them now as CBOs because that's much easier. Um, you can apply for this on the drone zone. So this is the FAA drone zone. Um, what all of this does is that it allows CBOs to put together guidelines and recommendations on what those guidelines could be for CBOs, um, for example. And these are the big important ones at the top, right? A CBO has to be a 501c3. It has to have a mission um, in the form of a statement or something that's on the website that is in furtherance of model aviation. And so model aviation is a wider track that includes, of course, drones, um, fixed wing, flying, RC, things like that. Um, it also needs to have, a CBO must have programming and support for clubs or chapters and can assist and support in the development and operation of flying sites. CBOs can also apply for FRIAs, which are federally recognized identification areas. We'll get a little bit more into what the differences are between a fixed flying site and a FRIA. Um, Actually, if you don't mind, go to the next slide, Diana, please. All right. So let's talk a little bit about FRIAs and fixed flying sites. And now these are really, really going to be important for those of you who um, are in towns, cities, states, local governments, as you're looking at where can people fly? All right. So. If you could, all please repeat after me. Frias and fixed sites are two completely different things. They are not the same thing. They sound similar. I know they both start with F. It's very hard. But they are super different. Next slide, please. They come from different ACs, advisory circulars. And so within those, like you can find the AC for the FRIAs, which is AC 89.3, and then the AC for um, the exception for limited recreational operators of unmanned aircraft. And so that one is going back to what we were just talking about, so the CBOs. If you'll move forward one, please. All right, so here, are going to be where some of these real differences are. So the FRIA is a federally or an FAA recognized identification area. What is that? Why, why do we need this kind of identification area anyway? Well, with remote ID, this is the rule that will be, um, must be in full compliance. Uh, September 16th, 2023, all drones have to have remote ID on them. Now, there are going to be particular kinds of drones, for example, things like home-built drones that won't have uh, remote ID or older drones that don't have remote ID. So when this rule comes into full effect, people will want to still fly their drones and a FRIA will be able to be that one place where they can do that. So you can fly in a FRIA without remote ID but just in that FRIA. And as you can see from the slide, there are a couple of other little things here as well. You have to operate uh, within visual line of sight. Both the operator and the aircraft have to be in this FRIA. And the FRIAs, once you have applied for them and that was granted, those are uh, valid for 48 months. Next slide, please. Fixed sites. So what, what is the difference now? The fixed site is 
a particular field where you can fly. Sounds pretty similar. Um, and these are generally in controlled airspace. So when we start talking about airspace, right, um, there is controlled airspace, there is uncontrolled airspace, and controlled airspace is typically going to be near airports or other um, areas that have that you'll find on airspace maps um, where it is limited, where you can fly height-wise. And so with that, um, a fixed flying site is going to be an area that you can fly within um, within that controlled airspace at a certain height only. And once you've got that fixed site, um, you don't have to put in for airspace authorizations. Next slide, please. So these fixed flying sites, anybody can apply for these. Um, they are technically permanent. Um, so and you will find them within, as I mentioned, controlled airspace. So this would be class B, C, D, and E2. Um, these, like I mentioned, are, are going to be in this area. It's going to be there for a while. And we've actually seen a couple of schools, for instance, that have UAS programs that have um, applied for fixed flying sites because they are right by an airport um, and within that grid. Next slide, please. So for the fixed, oh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So here are going to be some of these main differences. Um, and I think a really, really important one to think about is that the FRIAs are equipment-based sites. Right? You either have remote ID or you don't have remote ID, and that's what qualifies a FRIA. A fixed site is not equipment-based. It is actually airspace-based, so it, it, it's got to be um, in a particular area, and the fixed site is going to be three-dimensional. So, you know, you've got your little circle, where, you know, on the floor is, you know, you can walk around and it goes up to only a particular height. In a Freya, this is actually just two dimensional, right? It, it's only a space on the ground. You've got your flat two dimensional um, boundaries. You can fly as well up to 400 feet because it's, that's as high as you can fly a drone. Um, next slide, please. You can have FRIAs completely on their own. This is, a, as we mentioned in the beginning, a completely different thing from a fixed flying site. You can have both of them on their own. And you can have them together. So you can have a fixed flying site um, on top of a FRIA. Go to the next slide, please. This actually kind of illustrates what this will look like. So if you see that um, the big green cylinder, that's your fixed flying site. As I mentioned, it is three-dimensional. Below, you will see a little blue circle. That's your free up. That's it. Just that border on the ground. Anything outside of that border will require remote ID. If you'll go to the next slide, please. All right. So here, here's a little bit more for you and with some visuals because those are great. Um, and I think it really helps drive home the point uh, of what is happening here. You've got, this is not to scale, by the way. Uh, sorry about that. You've got your drone operator and you've got your drone. Both are within the FRIA and the fixed flying site. In this case, you do not need an airspace authorization and you do not need remote ID. In the next slide, you will actually see that the drone is within a fixed site, but the operator is outside of the FRIA. So what do we need? 
You don't need an airspace authorization because you are flying in a fixed site. However, the operator is outside of the PREA, so you do need a remote ID. Next slide. And here's one more example for you. Um, both the operator and the drone are outside of the fixed flying site and the FRIA. So you're going to need both an airspace authorization and you're going to need remote ID. All right. Oh, that was a lot. Um, if you've got questions, I'm here, you know, all day. Um, and, and let's kind of bring this back a little bit to remote ID. So this rule um, was uh, effective um, earlier this late, last year, um, and we've got the two dates that are coming up, um, effective dates. So the first date was September 16th, 2022, and that date was for manufacturers. This has been pushed back until December 16th. 2022. So what this means is that manufacturers have until December 16th to start making drones with remote ID. Luckily, there is a means of compliance um, that ASTM has put forward and it has been approved by the FAA. Because of that, we have had numerous declarations of compliance submitted and approved. And you can find all of those on that website here. Um, the larger effective date is for all drone pilots to be compliant with remote ID, and that date is September 16th, 2023. So we're coming up on it uh, pretty soon, and there, there's going to be a lot more um, communication about what that's going to look like. Um, and you'll hear more communication as well from the FAA Office of Communications. So with that, um, I think my part is done and I am actually super excited to be introducing the next person. Um, and you may want to make oh. sure, Alina, uh, Tina, do we know if Jake came on yet? Yes, he's here. Okay, cool. Hey, Jake. Great, great. All, All right. right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, if there are any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, or you can hold on to them till after um, the presentations are done. We'll be here for a little bit. All right. With that, uh, Diana, you can go ahead to the next slide if you don't mind. Um, so I'm going to introduce Tina. Um, Tina has been with the Weld County Public Works since 2000. In 2005, she was promoted to supervisor over the vegetation division and received her QS spray license. Her division is responsible for mowing, spraying, and seeking landowner compliance with county code. In 2019, Tina received her Part 107 certificate, and since 2020, she has been responsible for the small UAS program at Public Works. Tina? Yeah, and um, Jake's actually going to oh. start it off. So sorry. Uh, no, no worries. Want to go ahead? Yeah. And let me Jake? let me do a quick introduction. Uh, Jake Marshall. He's been an educator for 16 years in the North Colorado region, a creator of career and technical education STEM aviation programs from middle school to the collegiate level, and author of flight test STEM, currently being used around the U.S. in over a thousand schools. Currently at Ames Community College is the chief instructor pilot developing the aviation department uh, UAS program. He's a part 107 pilot, part 141 certified pilot with over 100 safely executed missions conducted with high school to college age students. Ames Community College is one of our collegiate training initiative schools in our program. Uh, Jake is our point of contact. And Jake, uh, Tina, both, we're just delighted to have you here today. Are you going to run your slides? Because I will need to open them up. This is just a screenshot. Uh, I was under the assumption you guys were going to run our slides. Okay, well, give me just a second. Go ahead and start. And then I'll, I'm going to stop sharing and pull up the presentation. No problem. That's actually perfect because I did get a question about Frias. Okay. Um, which perfect. I actually 
neglected to talk about. So who can apply for a FREA? So free, to apply for a FREA, you have to be either, actually it's more than two. So you have to be a CBO or an Institute of Higher Education or a JRO TC program. Um, and the application to apply for FRIAs are on the drone zone. So you can go ahead and apply for those there. Um, again, you do have to be a CBO or an educational institution to apply for a FRIA. Are there other questions? Okay. All right. I have, this is the PDF, but it, it should be fine. So just tell me when to advance and I'll be happy to. You can go ahead and advance. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning in to uh, uh, Tina and I's presentation. Uh, we have a pretty cool partnership over here in Weld County. Uh, very excited to, to share and have an opportunity to share with you guys. It's an honor, so thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Jake Marshall, and I'm the Chief Instructor Pilot here at Ames. Um, we've been tasked to create a UAS program at Ames Community College. Um, we formed the uh, first class in 2021, just a little bit about the program first. Uh, and then in uh, 20, 2021, we became a, a CTI, a recognized school. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, currently, we offer an academic certificate um, for uh, basic operator, um, but the uh, the goal in the future, in near future, is to go after a UAS science associate's degree, along with adding some more certificates. Uh, like that, I have an advanced U.S. operator, so we're going to be working with some high complex aircraft, so BB loss beyond visual line of sight operations. Um, and then we're also going to be introducing uh, some UAS design and engineering, so not only uh, getting our students to be trained in flying, but as well as being able to engineer and solve the next generation of aircraft is, is kind of our goal. Um, the Some of the achievements uh, for the program, just in the start of the uh, the spring of 2021, we have over 500 plus flights and hours uh, uh, on campus, and we have a little bit over 100 plus hours um, off campus. It's taken the college and the aviation department, along with a lot of smart people, um, a lot of work to get our students to be able to operate safely off campus and what do those um, processes look like, uh, what does the insurance look like, um, and uh, uh, having students be able to go off campus was was the huge um, ask for the program. Uh, at Ames, we don't just like to talk about the programs or talk about the applications um, or operation pieces uh, with UAS, we actually like to apply them. Um, so students are getting ground, they're actually getting flight training, and then at the very end of their capstone within an academic certificate, uh, students are actually able to go off campus and apply these skill sets that they're learning, which is pretty cool. Um, we have done since then, because of the fact that we can get off campus, over 20 contractual missions, uh, including um, defense work with DARPA and uh, Toyon, and uh, what we are sharing today is our huge uh, partnership with Wealth County. Uh, next slide. So Will County, uh, Tina came to me um, and had already reached out uh, to the program before it was even established and said, we need work, we need help. Uh, and so we have been um, getting a, a program set up and, and by the time of 2024, uh, we'll really be able to uh, launch a full scale uh, attack on Willow County for, for doing U.S. Um, application work uh, in partnership with them. Uh, we're uh, going to achieve a brand new academics um, building in 2024. Uh, this building will house future training for BB loss and um, uh, uh, basic operator training uh, for our students, as well as having fab labs and design labs for design um, and uh, fabrication integration within our curriculum, which is pretty cool. Um, and this will also be a, a location that Tina and I and, and other partners in the area will be able to connect to on a community level uh, to hold events, future trains, and um, also work with our high school. So we'll be able to really create that pipeline that I'll start with the high school that will work its all the way to Tina, hopefully, in, in the near future. Next slide. So we have this ginormous playground uh, with Weld County. Um, and uh, starting back in the fall of 2021, 
Uh, Tina tasked our students, our ops students, we have an ops workforce development program to kind of create this process of getting our students off campus and doing application work in and around Weld County. Um, it went off with a bang. Uh, Tina was there and we had 10 students that were so excited. Uh, I've never had students so excited to do pre-flight plans uh, in the program. Uh, when we started doing that, they spent a whole week pre-flight planning, delivered the pre-flight plan that Tina can look over. She approved it. We went out there, executed the mission safely. It was awesome. Uh, coming back and doing the post-data analysis and then working with Tina uh, to deliver um, uh, the content that she needed. And so as we kind of, you know, made the process and kind of uh, fixed it and made it so that it's workable, it's actually kind of gone down into our U.S. application courses where our students uh, learn about film infrastructure. Um, the students learn about uh, construction. They learn how to use some of the software associated with them, like PIX4D and UGCS. Um, and so by the end of the semester, uh, they're reaching out to Tina and saying, what do you got, Tina? And, and Tina has, um, you know, projects that are multi-road construction projects, um, large land development, communication tower inspections, bridge inf uh, infrastructure inspections, and gravel pit volume calculations. The students um, then work with Tina to create a flight plan uh, using what they learned in our training class and our applications class. They create a safe uh, execution of that plan, uh, doing risk assessment pieces as well. They actually then get approved by Tina to go out and uh, they conduct the mission, coming back, doing the post-production um, and then delivering that to Tina so that she can then move forward with uh, communication with the projects within Wilt County. So uh, it, yes, this is a cool way to, to share our, our program and how uh, all the cool things that Ames is doing for UAS, but honestly, it's more of a huge thank you presentation to Wilt County as they're giving us this opportunity for our students to actually apply what they're learning and go have fun out there in the workforce uh, and doing it in a respectable way that is not hindering the industry in our area. Um, you know, with we're very respectful of the industry. Uh, it's, you know, if we have an army of student pilots, uh, we can barely saturate it. So um, coming up with a system that is respectful with the industry and working with her, uh, it's been a true blessing. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to Tina so she can um, talk about uh, her side of, of us uh, working for her. Awesome. Diane, if you can move to the next slide. Oh, there's oh. some of the projects. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I forgot, I vomited all over the screen here. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, real quick, sorry, Tina, this is no one of the projects uh, that we did um, over the past a couple of semesters. Like you see the, the volume pieces, the pix 4 d uh, pieces, the digital surface map up in the top right, bridge inspections, tower inspections, um, to do an ISOs. And um, it's, like I said, it's just a variety of, of projects that are so cool uh, and are so relevant to our students. Uh, they're digging this, this application piece. We've had the opportunity now for several outside entities to come in to ask for, you know, what kind of skill sets that our students are, are being, uh, that are acquiring within our program. And it's so awesome to say that they're doing exactly what they're wanting within their, their programs, uh, that our students are in some cases getting hired before they even finish the academic certificate. So it's hey. without, without Tina and these opportunities in Weld County helping us, there, there'd be no way that we can produce this type of student and with this kind of skill set. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. That's awesome to hear. Um, yeah, so when I started in 2019, I kind of went out and got my certificate just to prove. So this is kind of for anyone thinking about starting a program. So I proved to the commissioners and my bosses that we can do this. We can have our license and um, get going. So we were able to put into the budget request for 2020 to purchase some drones. Then we had to figure out what drones to purchase. And with there just being two of us at that time that had our licenses, we did go with a little parrot on a feast, which are tiny and small, but the cost was the right entry point level. And according to my boss, you know, not the end of the world if we crashed them while we were trying to learn. So that's kind of where we started. And for these three years, we've just been running the little parrot on a feast. Um, they are definitely getting aged out. And the importance of building into your program, 
the ability to transition, get new drones, new equipment um, on some sort of a more regular basis and or two, having a lovely partner like Ames to reach out to that has all those updated lovely toys um, that allows you to accomplish stuff. So every year we've just been doing more flights in-house, trying to prove the demand um, and the uh, what the drones can do and what information we can provide to the rest of public works in terms of our engineers, our gravel department, met, pavement, um, mining, um, and all of those entities. And then, um, so in 2020, we ended up forming a committee in-house and we have at least one individual from each division. So there are nine of us on the committee um, that are all working towards getting their licenses so that we can have a small group internally that can go out and fly. We just are limited on the equipment. Right now we only have two little on which makes life quite entertaining. Um, and so we have built in for next year to be able to purchase some new units. And then again, it falls into what do you go with? What's the best skills? How much do you invest in terms of RTK, um, multi-spectral cameras and all of the other fun jazz that's out there on the market. And me coming from the weed division and vegetation, my ultimate goal is to have a drone that actually sprays. So working towards that part one of 137 and jumping through all of those hoops is the ultimate goal. Um, and in the meantime, we're having fun helping out the other divisions and working with Ames and growing that. If you can go to the next slide. So we kind of put together both challenges of an internal program and partnerships. You know, the benefits are huge. It's definitely awesome to have someone to share that workload with um, because as us at the public works, I mean, we have our regular jobs that we have to do year round. And this is just one more piece on top of it. So having AIMS available and to be able to reach out and have the kids help out with the projects is wonderful. It obviously, as we all know, is increased safety for our workers. It puts them out on the roads less collecting data. It just changed the risk, um, having the drones in the air and making sure everybody's stable and we don't have electrical interference from power lines, which in Weld County seems to be my biggest frustration. And or some of the, um, I think some of the landowners have some devices out there blocking stuff. So every now and then I get some fun messages up on my drones. Dang it. Um, we get tons of extra data and knowledge from the air looking down the what we can see on the ground looking out vertically. So it's a whole new realm of storage of data and usefulness and how to incorporate it so that it's not overwhelming. And again, again, that def different visual perspective. It's a lot quicker to capture our data, you know, a 20 to 30 minute pass can capture everything that we need to be able to calculate stockpiles um, versus, you know, walking around with our grade rod and taking hours to capture that same data. And then the documentation is just so much more in depth with everything that the drones can capture, which is phenomenal and wonderful. Well, there is, with everything, challenges. And availability, either internally with my own staff or other employees here at Public Works on the committee, and then with Ames, you know, they've got class schedules and we have work projects and making sure that the availability is there when it's needed for everybody. And as we all know, weather, I keep telling everybody with both my jobs, weeds and flying, I'm kind of a fair weather gal. So if it's too cold or too windy or raining or snowing, well, we're not doing a whole lot of anything other than sitting in the office here, um, working on paper, yay. So those are always fun challenges. Um, having clear expectations for people within my committee and our program and what we're gonna go with, as well as any partnerships that are established are essential for it to run and work smoothly. And then there's always, programs, the processing time that it takes to run PIX4D, the ability to share data and to work through all those hiccups and glitches that come um, and realize that it takes time. We had one of the supervisors who wanted his staff to go fly a road for documentation. And I'm like, you should have thought about that yesterday because all the batteries are dead and we haven't kept them charged because it's winter. So again, it's that the expectations of what's available, what can be done and how much time it all takes to process everything and pull it together. I'll turn it back over to Jake. Thanks, Tina. 
Yeah. So like Tina said, um, she kind of talked about, you know, where does she want to go with the public works division? Um, I know that we're, we both got some crazy plans uh, for our students uh, coming up um, for us uh, with our facility advancing to a, um, a BV loss operation will allow us to do some some fairly large uh, linear uh, asset data collections in, in the future. Um, you know, sometimes Tina will throw our students on a 200 acre data collection and to have a fixed wing that can do it in, in 10 minutes rather than a couple hours with the multi rotor is, is um, and of course beyond uh, visual on a site would be, is something that we're, we're striving to, to be able to provide that to her. And, and just like once again, give our students an opportunity to be able to put those um, operations in practice. Um, some of the future things that we're looking at getting to is, is starting to work with uh, the NDVI sensors, multispectral sensors, uh, to be able to, to, to dev uh, provide some, some different data collections uh, for Weld. Uh, but once again, I mean, just having the opportunity uh, for our students to be able to go out and actually apply this and learn this before they go out into industry is, is huge. Um, it, it's priceless to have our students be able to go out and say that they have done X, Y, and Z for Weld County and have operated with these type of sensors, it's it's um it's gonna go a long way. And with that, that's that's it for us. If there's any questions, um, there's our contact information for, for both uh, myself and Tina. Uh, we also have a, a, um, a link down there to our certificate program at Ames, um, but I'm open for any questions if there is any. Let's take a peek in the chat here. I'm not seeing, do you all see any, I don't see any questions there. P please feel free to raise your hand or, you know, come off mute and you can ask your question. I'm gonna stop the share. Did everybody get their contact information? And we'll send this out after a recap. No questions? I just want to address some of the questions in the chat, if that's all right, Diana. Thank you. Do, because I need to pull up the other presentation. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think there's been a good conversation down there in in the chat, um, specifically, again, talking about remote ID. Um, so, you know, there was a question about what are the specifications as far as the signal for the broadcast? Um you know, when the rule was written, we made sure that it was uh, open, right? We we wanted to make sure that industry had room to come up with whatever they felt was best um, as far as what kind of signal, right? So we did not, we were not specific about what kind of signal um, the broadcast should be in. Um, with the MOC from ASTM, that is currently the only uh, means of compliance for remote ID that's out there. Um, they do specify, and Zach thankfully linked to that, um, to the full text of the ASTM standard or uh, means of compliance there. Um, it does go into more about what the signal is. I'm going to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about different kinds of signals, so I'm not going to be the best person to talk about it with. Um, but if you do have more questions, we can definitely get you in touch with the right person here um, moving forward. Are there other questions about remote ID? You can voice them or put them in the chat or just send them directly to me. All right. So, Alina, real quick, just wanted to, to reiterate, yeah, I did that, yeah. but, uh, um, you know, the, the stuff that Ames Community College has going on uh, with their, their local county is absolutely awesome. And I'll tell you, if you if you take the time to look around there, there are schools near you. Uh, there's a list of CTI schools, and I put a link to that in the uh, in the chat there. Uh, there's also a nice convenient map. I we're up to, I think, 98 schools over 40 states. So chances are there may be one near you. They would love to find ways to work with local and regional governments or even state governments uh, to, to not only get their students uh, to develop their portfolios, uh, but just to find ways to work together. And, and there's tons of benefits, as they were talking about, uh, the, the cost sharing, the getting a, you know, a, a 
the the county getting a crew of you know 20 students in a class uh, to be able to do stuff so uh, please take the time and, and look there if there's any projects that you're looking about and uh, they may have the knowledge and the resources to be able to uh, to maybe sell whoever your boss is on a drone program for your county or for your you know uh, branch of the government so all right thank you Alina Zach um Tina and Jake, good, really good presentation. Um, this is what the CTI program is all about. This is what meeting today is all about. Again, networking, getting you all together, learning that, you know, how to be creative, um, you know, utilizing each other for, for work like you all are doing. So really, really do appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a few things that we're doing um, within the uh, FAA, uh, how we're engaging. Um, you see here droning on. We've been uh, this past year, we actually went to, uh, we've been to a few of our regions, but what the droning on series, which were regional events was all about, uh, was, was with the UAS integration office uh, in partnership with our regional offices. Um, we have been fortunate that uh, CTI schools have been host to our um, what we've done this past year or this year rather. I'll also tell you a little about what's coming up, but they're free events um, to any you know anyone that wants to attend. It's typically two to three days. Um, and what we're doing, and it's really important that we promote that safety culture in our drone operations. That's what's that's what our office is all about. Uh, we also want to we want your operations to happen. You know, we want, but we want them to be safe. So we we try to bring together. Uh, when we've had these regional events, the service centers and or um, our leap agents have joined us, the local FISDOs, because you know they're the ones that you may want to need to get your answer from. So it's been just a, a really, really good thing. We want to build those working relationships, uh, you all to build them, us to build them with you. So we've completed four. We've been to Central Region, uh, University of Nebraska, Omaha. We went to New England. We were at the University uh, of Maine. Uh, it was in Brunswick, the University of Maine at Augusta. Um, this picture here is from that event. I especially love it because these were retirees, people that heard about it and they came out and they were genuinely interested. We even kind of got our thought process going where I was trying to pull together uh, programs to uh, to educate. And, you know, so we were coming up with some really fun ideas for uh, those that are retired and maybe a, a little older and wiser, I fall into that category, by the way. <laughs> so we just loved that they were genuinely interested and they got out there and they flew and they flew well to have never touched a drone. We had them out flying. The facility um, is actually an airport. Um, it used to be the uh, Naval Air Station there in Brunswick. So we were in the hangar. We had a lot of really cool uh, aircraft that we got to view while we were there. And then we went over to uh, University of North Dakota at Grand Forks. Um, and that was um, what an amazing aviation school. Uh, it's pretty flat, I will say that. But we did. We had such a great experience. Um, again, the FISDO office uh, staff comes out, The what we call the FAA safety team program managers have been very engaged with us at all our events. Um, and then we uh, were at Southern Region was our last event. And that was over at uh, NC State University there in Raleigh, North Carolina. And again, some of you all presented. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, I saw you when we first came on. Um, we have coming up. We already have semi-committed. I hope I've got the right dates here. Alina, pop in if I'm incorrect. But the Alaskan edition, this is called Droning On, Alaskan edition, Eastern edition. Uh, we're going to have that at Warren Community College in Washington, New Jersey. Dr. Will Austin is hosting us. Um, Alaska will be at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Um, and then we have three others that are to be determined where we've been in meetings with them and we're hoping to get them to commit. I also wanted to share that if you haven't heard uh, AUVSI's annual conference, uh, Exponential will be the second week in May. That's where we met a lot of our drone pros, a lot of our CTI uh, points of contact, you, and we hope that we'll see you there again. It's going to be in Denver. 
We're also talking about uh, Drone Safety Day 2023. I think Kamisha is with us today. She's going to work with Alina and then, of course, us as a team do all we can to support. We're going to keep with the same theme of Fly Right, uh, register your drone, interact with others, gain knowledge, have a safety plan, trust and train, trust being that trust test. Uh, we are hoping for March or April, and um, we'll work again with NCAT to make that happen. Uh, they, the, the process was simple to go and register your event, uh, working with agencies, and then just a, a really streamlined uh, event registration. Something else that we're doing, um, I, we've been talking about the CTI Ames being one of the schools. Um, we, let me just update you a little. Um, and, and I'd also like, uh, Scott, are you still with us, Scott Gore? He wasn't sure. He, he was afraid he'd have to leave early. Okay, Scott is also on our team, uh, but just to give you a quick update about the Collegiate Training Initiative Program, Zach had mentioned we're at 98 schools. Um, we launched this program April 30th, 2020. Uh, we had our first meeting in September following that launch, and we had like 30 schools, and we are now at 98 which is super exciting. Um, the CTI program focuses on workforce development. We do have other programs here at the FA that are more that research side. We call it the Assure program. You may be familiar with that. But this is all about workforce development. Vance Granville Community College is our newest member. They truly just joined this week. Um, and then Ohio State University and Williston State College joined last month. A North Carolina A&T State University joined in September, and they are one of our uh, historically black college and universities. So we're really happy about that. Because we're excited, we want to speed things up. So we're going to try to double our number. I think it can happen. I really do. Uh, Venus, if you see her face in the in the group here, she has been pushing out recruitment letters to people that we've learned about that maybe you've sent us their name, their contact information. Don't assume if they have a UAS program that they are part of this CTI program. And we are happy to reach out to anybody you send our way. Uh, we'll even schedule a meeting so that we can talk about the program with them. So please help us with this. Um, just, you know, like I said, send them our way and we'll do the recruiting. But 200 for 2023, that, that's our, our motto <laughs> for the CTI program. Some things that we're working on now that we're really excited about, and I know when Jake was talking about, I think it was actually Tina talking about getting her 137 for spraying, uh, we are working on an agriculture program. Um, in fact, it's going to be managed by our central region, um, and it's called Plant a Seed. We just love this little logo, Safety, Education, Environment, and Development. Some outreach has already been happening. Um, you know, we've talked with local, state, tribal governments. We want to have this ongoing collaborative effort. Um, we already we have people within the FA who are those uh, SMEs for Part 137, uh, and we would just want to be able to point them, like anybody uh, within the agricultural world wanting to use drones for whatever, that we do direct them to the right people and help them with if they need to write a certain waiver, all of that. So that's really what this program is all about. And you'll hear more from that, I'm sure, uh, in the coming months. We have a person on, um, well, I forgot the word, on detail, <laughs> that's the word, on detail from another uh, area of the FAA, um, who is a veteran. And we have many veterans within the FAA. And so we're putting together a veterans UAS educational project. I know that counties, um, schools, uh, cities, a lot have uh, veterans programs within, within their, uh, into whatever it is with the organization. And so again, we want to be able to pull that, those resources together, information so that you have that one place to stop and shop. Uh, and we we're even in discussions about how we could also fund, perhaps, um, you know, whether it's through the GI program, the schools working uh, with 
uh, the GI Bill, the money that's funded there, but also maybe some grant money uh, from within the FAA for those that maybe don't meet that uh, for the GI Bill. So again, more on that. And then we just had a meeting with our STEM uh, ABSED, which is the Aviation and Space Education Director, as well as a few of her representatives. And um, because of the CTI program and, and all the educational projects and programs we have going on, we get a lot, the support center, we do a lot of messages asking about high school programs, drone clubs. So we are pulling together, I said high school program, but really it would expand. It would be the, the 4-H, it'd be the boys and girls clubs, the scouts, um, maybe a civil air patrol that wants to have that specific drone program. And again, um, we're all about good communication, making sure that you can easily get to resources. Um, this may be not always been so easy, but it definitely is a passion of the group that's here with me today from the FAA. And we just really want to, to make that happen. And what do you know? We are done. <laughs> so do you have any, and you can see I went to a blue screen because my face just turned blue. <laughs> So do you have any questions or comments? I'm going to stop the share. Um, we will post our, 